Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session of InfluxDB IOX Tech Talks. My name is Caitlin Croft. I am super excited to have you all here today. We'll just give all of our friends a couple minutes to join. So we'll just go over a couple of friendly reminders. This session is being recorded, so it will be available for replay later today, as well as the slides will be available for review as well. So don't worry, obviously we'd love for you to stay for the whole time, but if you need to drop out, you will be able to go and check out the slides and the recording uh, later today. Um, this is Zoom, so please feel free to post any questions you may have in the Q&A box or the chat. We will be monitoring both and we will get uh, Paul Ed and Andrew to answer all of your questions at the end. So don't be shy. They love uh, hearing from you guys and seeing what you guys are interested in about this new project and just getting your feedback on it as well. So we look forward to seeing uh, comments from you come in. A couple of other friendly reminders. We do have the community Slack channel, which is a really awesome resource to stay connected with the InfluxDB community, which includes a, a lot of InfluxDB employees, uh, including all the engineers who are building uh, these products. Uh, so it's a really great resource. And it's also fun to just see what other community members are doing. We of course have our forums as well. Of course, events this year, again, are gonna be pretty much virtual. So super excited to announce that Influx Days EMEA 2021 will be happening on May 18th and 19th. It will be virtual. Uh, Call for Papers is still open. Call for Papers closes this Friday. So we're super excited to see all the different things that our community is doing and reviewing your submissions. So we look forward to seeing you all there as well. We also have all of our other webinars and other virtual events, such as virtual time series meetups, which have been really fun. Uh, we've been doing a lot of hobbyist topics recently, so be sure to check those out. So without further ado, I am going to hand things off to Paul Dix. All right, thanks, Caitlin. Can you hear me? You sound great. All right, great. Uh, okay, so thanks everybody for joining us for the, for the tech talk today. Uh, I just wanted to give a quick update on the project before I hand it over to Ed, who's going to talk about uh, much more interesting things. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, just in case, InfluxDB IOX is basically the new core of InfluxDB that we're building. It's written in Rust. It's using Apache Arrow as the core underlying technology. Uh, it's basically a columnar time series database that uses object store as its persistence layer. Uh, and it's a number of other things as well, but that's for later. Uh, so updates, hold on a sec. Um, so the progress so far, uh, we have new team members, uh, Dom who joined us actually a few months ago and then Marco and Raphael who joined us uh, last week. And we have another team member, Na, who's joining us next week. So that makes uh, it a much bigger team, which means hopefully we're going to be making faster progress uh, over the next, over the next uh, few months. Uh, so we made, uh, Ed in particular has made a bunch of progress within the read buffer, which is basically the compressed columnar store that he's talking about today, execution engine. Uh, Andrew has made great progress on basically wiring up the mutable buffer, which is where writes land, and the read buffer, which is query optimized in the system so that they'll be queryable across uh, SQL, across influx QL, and flux. Uh, our uh, helpful contractors at Integer32 have landed Apache Arrow Flight, the API, into IOX and actually. To get that working, we had to do some contribution to uh, the Rust implementation of Flight. So now, uh, with the recent release of Arrow 3.0, um, the uh, Flight, the Rust Flight uh, uh, tests run, like those integration tests run, in addition to Python and all the other first-class languages uh, that Apache Arrow has. Um, 
And then the other thing is over the last uh, week or so, we've had an internal discussion, some of which has been on the GitHub issues and a lot of which has happened kind of synchronously over Zoom uh, about how we're going to handle basically a bunch of IOC servers working together, how they will replicate data, uh, how the write ahead logs will work across them and how you'll be able to split roles from servers that are receiving writes versus servers that are uh, receiving queries. Uh, so uh, Dom wrote up a document kind of capturing all of that. Uh, obviously, I'm, I don't think you can click the link here, but I will put it up on Twitter right after I get done speaking. Uh, so I'll put a link to that doc. It's public so people can read through it. So we've also made some decisions on the API. Um, we kind of this is very, very recent. We've been debating about these things. So obviously all this is kind of subject to change uh, over the next few months as we really like hammer out the details, but this is kind of where we've landed. So the management API will be uh, over gRPC, which just makes it easier to have us, you know, have a declarative thing, this document and all this other stuff. Uh, we'll have the command line interface for common tasks, like creating databases and stuff like that to make it easier to use. Uh, for writing data into IOX, we'll have uh, InfluxDB 2.0 line protocol, which we currently support. Uh, we also want to add support for just posting flat JSON objects uh, to the database, basically events. And then we've also been thinking about protobuf. Somebody brought this up last month as uh, something they wanted. So we may have that open because the set of data ty types that we want IAX to support is broader than what line protocol supports. And we'd rather just uh, piggyback off something like protobuf that will give people like strong typing and all this other stuff. On the query side of things, uh, we'll you know, expose querying via HTTP. They'll return CSV. Currently, you can do that with a SQL query. Uh, but we also want to support returning JSON or something that's basically just like you can display. Uh, it's kind of like a pretty print kind of thing. Uh, Arrow flight, which obviously we just added support for. And then we've also been talking about adding support for querying via Postgres uh, wire protocol. So what's next? Obviously the management API, we landed on the decision that it's going to be gRPC. Now we just need to start moving forward and converting some of the previous work we had done over to that and implementing all the new endpoints. A bunch of persistence work, basically persisting the mutable buffer and the read buffer. Uh, in Parquet files to object store. Some of this work has already been done, but it needs to be reworked a little bit with the new system. Um, recovery from object store, and that's both from the write ahead log and from the persisted partitions and chunks uh, that are Parquet files. Replication and subscription, replication for the write ahead log, subscriptions for query servers that are pulling data. Uh, and then obviously official builds and documentation, we wanna get to that. Originally we were targeting uh, the end of this month for that, uh, based on all these changes we've recently made and basically this internal back and forth, we're probably not gonna get to that. Uh, we also have our company yearly kickoff uh, the week after next, which is gonna impact all of our uh, ability to, to work on IOX. So now we're targeting late March for that, but uh, with the goal of having a lot of this stuff wired up in the some initial stage where you can actually test end to end uh, and start playing around with things. And that is all I have. Obviously I'll be around for the Q&A after Ed's talk. Ed, hand it off to you. Thank you. I'm just gonna share my screen. Hopefully this is all working. Can everyone see me the screen okay and hear me? Looks great. Thumbs up. Great. Okay. Brilliant. Um, okay. Let's get going. So, hi. Uh, so I'm Ed. Um, I'm an en uh, engineer at Influx Data, um, working on the IOPS project. Um, I've actually been at Influx Data for about four years, uh, but for about five years, four years of which I was working on InfluxDB, uh, mainly on the storage engine and the right path and indexing. So I'm kind of familiar with um, the use cases that it's really great for and, and where some of the some of the kind of issues are around other use cases and what we're trying to and how we're going to try and solve those problems in IOX, um, which I've been working on and in Rust with uh, Paul and Andrew and, and others now for, for just over a year. So 
what are we what are we working towards so like these are just some of like the things that like i guess we think about at a kind of a high level around like performance scalability in terms of iops right so we effectively want to be able to handle unlimited data um that means realistically that we're going to need to leverage things that are very scalable like object storage um it means we're going to need to think about things like compression we don't want to be um, storing like unlimited amounts of data in a, in a, in a like large law way. We want to think about being able to support unlimited cardinality. Um, sometimes this is, gets referred to as infinite cardinality, but I think unlimited is perhaps more appropriate. But that effectively just means that you just don't have to worry about cardinality, right? So if you have a high cardinality use case, you should be able to just treat that like more data, right? Not, not different data. Um, and so in order to kind of be able to handle unlimited amounts of cardinality, we have to think very carefully about data organization, right? And so one of the things that, we, that we're making a bet on in IOPS is that we, we don't want large secondary indexes because they're something that are expensive to maintain when you have huge amounts of cardinality. Um, and we want to like be amazingly fast and performant for analytical type queries. Um, and we think to do that, we're going to need to do some um, in memory uh, processing, we're going to need to be able to have in memory execution. We think that's the best medium for that data to sit on. Uh, and we think that a column, the data layout, column architecture is, is the way to do that. And then there's just like lots of uh, lots of other fanciness that I'm going to talk a bit about now. Um, so these are kind of, as Paul just mentioned, these are some of the things that we're leveraging, right? Mainly Rust uh, is helping us in a bunch of different ways that I'm not going to, not going to get into. Um, and Apache Arrow, brilliant in memory format. Um, and data fusion uh, is also a really interesting Rust project that provides us with a query engine. So this talk particularly is about um, a particular subsystem in IOX that we call the read buffer. Um, it's a new kind of query query execution engine. Um, we it's something I've kind of been working on, I guess, for about six months now, um, and we've been sort of spiking out various prototypes and, and kind of we're sort of settling on a design. And the idea is that we're gonna work um, on data that we hold um, in memory, um, particularly on the Rust heap. So we're gonna limit, in terms of the read buffer scope, there's basically no IO at read time. So the read buffer's either got it in memory on the heap to process, or it just doesn't have that data. We are not interested in like mapping and mapping things in and out. Uh, and we don't wanna be fetching things from like other storage mediums. That's gonna happen in IOPS, but that's not like it with the concern of the read buffer, right? It's up to other systems to make that data available in the read buffer. So we can think of this data as being immutable, which is another nice property, right? That means we can leverage certain techniques and certain approaches to improve the read performance. Um, and there's just a bunch of like interesting column store stuff that we're, that we're kind of doing in the read buffer. So obviously we have like a columnar representation. Um, we're as much as possible trying to work directly on this compressed representation. So I'll explain in more depth what that means in the talk. Um, we're basically leveraging things like vectorized execution and um, particularly we're trying to make use of modern kind of hardware features um, such as SIMD and things like that. And so we're thinking carefully about how we organize our data so that we can leverage those, those um, features. Uh, we're going to be able to do um, interesting things like um, predicate and projection pushdown, which I'll talk a little bit about later, but it just basically means um, getting um, all of the constraints around the data that you want from your query down as far as possible, as low as possible, so that you can remove the need to process as much data as possible. And you're just doing the minimum amount of work um, to basically answer the, the queries that you want to answer. Um, and as part of that kind of stuff, that sort of touches on what we call late materialization, which is another kind of well-known column, the database technique that effectively means um, you save the expensive part of your, um, you know, often referred to as tu tuple construction, right? You, you, you save the most expensive part of materializing all your raw underlying values as late as possible until you've got rid of as much data, done as much processing as you can um, before you go through that stage. So I'll talk about that later in the talk. Um, so like at a kind of very high level, like we want to just be able to do um, any kind of time series workload in IOPS, but we also want to be able to do particular time series workloads like things around events, like all of the observability things that you want to do around logging, tracing, large analytical workloads. Some of these like workloads typically are very high cardinality or high volume in terms of data. And so we think that um, IOPS can provide some kind of um, some help there. So like, as I'm sure some of you on the, on the meeting already know, we already have a time series database, right? So InfluxDB. Um, so let's just do like a really quick refresher about where we're kind of coming from 
in terms of what InfluxDB is really good at, what it's not so good at, and what kind of things we're trying to solve with IOPS. So InfluxDB is really great for IoT, for monitoring, for other time series use cases, right? There's loads of things you can use. Um, it's got really, really good block compression of most field and timestamp data. Um, sometimes you can get absolutely incredible compression. Sometimes you get not quite so good compression. It really just depends. But typically for time series data, it's very, very good. Um, it's got a very flexible data model. So you're not strict on like your schema. You've got to kind of decide what things you think of tags, what things you think of fields. Those are those distinctions are very important. Um, and you do have to kind of think about that up front. But aside from that, you can add new tags. You can change um, like you know bits of what your schema looks like. Um, Influx has got really good performance on selective queries. So what are selective queries? They're basically queries where you're only interested in a very, very small proportion of the date of the underlying data set, right? And um, you provide predicates um, and you know constraints and ranges to like specify exactly what you're after. Influx is really good at answering these kind of questions. Um, if you've got like like billions and billions of samples over like millions of different series, like InfluxDB is great for this because it can handle that kind of cardinality around the series. So when we talk about cardinality in Influx, we're talking about combinations of measurements and tag keys and, and field keys. And if you're in the millions there, it can handle that quite well. And then the billions of samples for those, uh, that amount of cardinality is not a problem because of all of its block compression, which is like really, really good. So. I'm not going to like jump into like all the details on this slide, but like I don't know if maybe some of you recognize this, but it's essentially like an internal tool we have that allows us to inspect the data format that InfluxDB persists its time series data in, which is called TSM files. And when we look at when I look at something like this, which I pulled from a an actual real like IoT use case, um, I can see that like we have almost a two gigabyte file. Um, and only about 75 megabytes of this file is the index, right? The index are basically the series keys that determine like where data lives within the file. But the file, although it's only two gig, or just under two gigabytes, it's got 525 million points in it, right? So there's only 3.6 bytes per point. So this is like very, very good compression that we've got going on here. We've got lots and lots of samples for a relatively small number of series. Um, so I figured out if, based on the contents of this file, if we just stored them uncompressed, just as like timestamps of 64 bits, um, there's lots of floats and integers in here, they were 64 bits, this would be like 67 gigs of data, but we we're able to compress it down to 1.8 gigs, which is really, really good. So unfortunately, though, um, if you have a different kind of use case, or a different, sorry, a different kind of workload that you use with InfluxDB, you can have problems and you don't leverage some of these benefits, right? So in this case, we're looking at a TSM file, which you might use for like a tracing use case. So often in tracing, as I'll talk about a bit later on, um, every single sample can essentially be unique. You end up with like one point per series because often you have like very high cardinality tag values, like these might be span IDs. Another example would be if you're like, doing a lot of monitoring in a very like ephemeral environment like Kubernetes or something, you might have like loads of container IDs that are like constantly changing. So you can have these like very high cardinality workloads with very few like samples per, per like series collected. So in this case, we've got like a 1.3 gigabyte TSM file, but like 1.1 gigabytes of it is the index because it's just full of like unique series. And we don't have much data per series, right? And so because we have to wrap all of our data points in our block compression that we do in InfluxDB, and we have to store them in various places and we have to point to those blocks, the TSM data um, for the blocks is actually, um, uh, I forgot that the wrong way around. So that basically the uncompressed, the uncompressed TSM, the uncompressed data for the, for the blocks um, would be like smaller than the, the TSM version. I think I've got those two the wrong way around. But basically we're doing a worse job than if we had just hadn't compressed it at all. So this is like not where Influx wants to be because you're not you're just not leveraging um, the the features of like Influx DB and TSM format. So there are ways ways around these like use cases by the way. So you can just like swap out tags for fields. Some people do that, but once you start to do that, you're restricting like the like the things you can do with the query language and those sorts of things. So um, like in summary. Like in pathological cases, like I've just described, the index dominates TSM and the compression that TSM is so good at isn't very useful when you don't have much to compress, right? So it's not kind of, this is like kind of obvious. 
Um, we also use MMAP in the TSM and InfluxDB, TSM formats in InfluxDB. Um, we found like through many years of like operating InfluxDB and, and, and enterprise versions and things like that, that sometimes MMAP can be unpredictable. Um, it's controlled by the kernel. You don't have a huge amount of control over it. Um, it can be difficult as well in containerized environments, things like C groups and stuff like that. It's just sometimes you just end up with booms when you shouldn't really be having them. Um, and you're basically paging in like 4Ks of data and you're hoping that the, all of the data in that 4K page is like relevant to, the, to like the workload that you're running. And often it isn't because of the way we, we organize the data. So the data in the TSM file is distributed according to the lexicographic order of the series keys, right? Because it's an SS table. But often you're querying not on the full series keys. Sometimes you're just querying on a single part of a series key, like a host or a region or an environment or something. And so your data ends up being completely randomly distributed through the file. And that's often like orthogonal to the, like the access patterns that you want. Um, the other problem is that for very high cardinality workloads and what, what I'll call non-selective queries, right? So that's where effectively you want to actually read most of your data set to answer some query, like a big, a big aggregate or something. Um, Influx DB over indexes because you've got this huge index that's like basically there to answer like very specific selective queries. And you're, you're basically asking that index for everything all at once, right? Because you want to aggregate across large volumes of data. So some of the like bets that we're making in IOCS are that with a columnar architecture and if we organize data in certain ways that we think makes like processing faster and keeps the footprint smaller, then we're essentially going to be better at some of these workloads that InfluxDB doesn't do so well at. Um, to do that, we think we're going to have to ditch these large secondary indexes. So InfluxDB also has these large indexes called, that's one called TSI, for example. Um, we think we need to not have those sorts of things in IOCs because like fundamentally, like a secondary index is, is only useful to you if the cost of reading and maintaining that index um, to find the data that you need to answer your query is, is less than actually the cost of just processing the underlying data, right? That's the only time that secondary indexes are gonna be a win for you. Um, and we're gonna say no to MMAP. Um, we think that it's better to have predictable memory usage. So if you, you have all of your data or a portion of your data in memory, it's on the heap, you know where it is, you can control what comes in and out. Um, you know, you, you're not like reliant on MMAP having the right things paged in the right places. Um, the other thing is as well is like we want to effectively only keep like relevant data in memory. So this is a bit of a higher level concept in IOPS. It's not so much about the read buffer. It's more about we want to have systems that make sure in IOPS that the right things are being moved in and out of the read buffer at the right time so that we've got the data that we really care about being held in memory. So we're thinking that for high cardinality like analytical workloads, we're going to do really well because of the, the design. And then we also think that the trade-off here, which I'll talk about later, is that um, even though we're not going to have indexes, big secondary indexes and things like that, that are really good for selective queries and selective workloads, we think that we can just keep close enough with basically very like smart engineering in terms of how we lay out the data, how we take advantage of vectorization, like materialization, all these column store techniques that effectively brute force will keep us close performance wise to systems that are like heavily indexed. All right, so the rest of the talk, um, I'm just gonna sort of dive into the read buffer. Now I've given a bit of a, a bit of an overview on where we're sort of coming from. I'm gonna look at um, how we lay things out, the representation, some of the compression stuff. Uh, what do I mean by late materialization in the read buffer? And then also it has some early numbers, right? Some comparative numbers. Um, and we'll talk a bit about the future improvements. So. Let's just talk about where the read buffer sits. Um, this is like a very rough, like right path diagram. Now this isn't, these squares aren't um, pieces of like different processes necessarily or pieces of software, but that's just more how data flows through the IOPS system. So obviously at the top, we have like writes come into the database, right? Um, so those writes will end up landing in the right head log in, the, in what's called the while buffer. That allows us to have replication to other IOPS servers. It also allows us for recovery. So if we lose the server, we can replay this right head log. But obviously, right head logs, um, maybe not obviously, but right head logs are not very good for querying, right? Because it's essentially just an append only log of events. So we need to be able to query the data as, like, as soon as it comes in or, or very close to when it comes in. So we, for that, we have this thing called the mutable buffer. 
um, that allows us to query this like written, recently written data. It's mutable because it has to be updated all the time, right? New data is coming in, we need to be able to query it. So um, it's a, it's similar to a mem, like a mem table. If any of you are familiar with that term. Um, but at some point though, we can't keep all of this data in the mutable buffer, right? So we need to sort of think about durability and we need to think about getting it into a format that's more read optimized. So at some point, the IOP server basically will be able to move data out of this uh, mutable buffer. We'll put it into an object store. That's like our storage persistence layer for durability. Um, and we'll also um, put, put some of it or all of it into the read buffer, right? And so the, when we put it into the read buffer, that's when we're essentially saying that this is now some immutable thing that we're gonna optimize uh, the layout of the format to make it very, very fast for read workloads. Uh, yeah, exactly. So that's like how, that's how the read buffer looks on the write path, but on the read path, so now we want to read from the system. This is kind of how things look. So we have like these different, um, or we will have all these different uh, front ends, right? So you'll be able to query with SQL, with Flux, with InfluxQL, maybe other front ends in the future. And effectively, they're all going to go into Query engine, which is powered by Data Fusion, very interesting project. Um, there's lo loads going on there, um, and that query engine is then going to be responsible for figuring out what's the best place to go and get an answer to this query. Right? Where? Where? Do, who has the data? Is it only in object storage? Do I need to go and pull it out of object storage? Has it been written in recently? Can I get it from the mutable buffer, or um, is it something that the read buffer is going to have? Right? And so the query engine will be responsible for running against all these execution engines. And then obviously like combining the results. Not all of these execution engines are gonna be able to, uh, you know, support every single possible kind of SQL query on whatever. So the query engine is also gonna be responsible for like figuring out, you know, what, who it can ask for what and what it has to do itself basically. Um, so I'm only really gonna focus now on the read buffer, right? Which is just one of these execution engines. So let's look at, um, how data is organized in the read buffer. It's very similar to how data is organized in other parts of IOPS. It's also quite similar to how data is organized in um, things like Parquet, for example, right? There are definite similarities there. Um, at like a very high level, uh, we just organize things by database, right? And so a database is kind of similar to a influx1.x database, if you're familiar with that. And if you're familiar with influxdb2, it's kind of similar to a, to a bucket. Um, so we can have multiple uh, databases inside the read buffer. And then within a single database, right, we can have these things called partitions. These are basically just um, sections of the key space of all the data that was written into this database. So most people we think at the moment, most use cases are going to want to partition by time. I think that's quite a common way to do things. So, you know, you'll basically have all the data written in for an hour in one partition then the next hour and the next hour. But you know you can partition by different things. You might partition by table or by host key or by some other thing. Within each of these like partitions, you're going to have these things called chunks, right? So partitions are like a logical concept. You, you decide as an operator um, or the system decides what's the best way to logically like separate out your data into sections. But chunks are more like a physical concept. So um, if you're partitioning by an hour, depending on how, how heavy your ingest is, that might be a, no, hardly any data or like huge amount of data. So we have these things called chunks. So chunks basically are just like a, a point in time where the data is a certain size or it's been sat uh, in a mutable buffer, for example, for a certain amount of time. And we want to just close it off and roll it over and make a new chunk. And so you have these like chunks within a partition and they're essentially just like subsections and they all have their own metadata. So it's actually very useful for allowing us to do like pruning and deciding whether or not we need to go and read data out of one of these chunks. Within a chunk, you have um, tables, right? And if you're familiar with InfluxDB, you'll see that these tables, like the labels I've given them anyway, look very similar to measurements, right? And so, and they are effectively. So um, if you're writing in line protocol into IOX, for example, your measurement name will become the table. Um, and so you have these various different tables and each one of these tables has a different schema, right? Because it's for a different thing. And then inside each table, right? You have these row groups. So row groups are like, now we're just getting a bit more concrete. Okay. So row groups are basically just like horizontal sections of a table. They're just like multiple rows within a table. And the reason we have, you might have one of them or many of them is 
for those various implementation reasons, but effectively they're all, they all have the same schema. You could think of them logically as just one table, but they're just physically separated in some ways. Um, we have like metadata on tables, like we have min and max for the various columns. Each row group also has a metadata that we'll look at on the next slide. And obviously we have a schema. So all of this like metadata is very useful when you're running a query to decide whether or not you even need to go and read into any of this data or whether you can just skip it. Now we're getting very concrete. So a row group, now it probably looks more like a columnar uh, table as well. So a row group is like the lowest sort of unit here before we get to a column. Um, it, has a, it has a schema. It has obviously metadata for each of the columns. Um, and that metadata again has a min max and, and that sort of thing, right? Once you get into a column, now you can kind of see, this is um, one of Andrew's slides that I pinched. Now you can kind of see what how we map line protocol to this model right so what the, the blue box is basically like a row group and uh, the colored columns are iox columns and you can see from the circles like how we map um how we map uh sorry how we map influx db line protocol to these different like column types um i'm going to talk now about like all the different types and things we can talk about in the columns and then we'll talk about how we compress them down because that's like a really important thing that we do so you can we can support in IOPS and Rebref at the moment, um, or we will be supporting soon at least, like these uh, logical types on the left. So you'll see that a lot of them are very similar to the ones that we support in InfluxDB. Um, and then the semantic column types is like, so we want IOPS to be able to support the InfluxDB data model and line protocol and all the use cases, but we want to be able to support like other data, mo other data models as well. And so we basically map InfluxDB um, things like tags and fields and timestamps onto certain column types. But we also want to be able to have um, just non InfluxDB specific columns um, that might have be able to support data types that, for example, you can't like have in line protocol. Um, so basically, we have a mapping, and effectively, you write, you write line protocol in, and we're going to map it to certain types of columns in IOX. So, for example, all of the tags that you write in will get converted into string columns. The fields will get converted into whatever the data type is of the line protocol field that we, you know, we support all of them. Um, Timestamps are into, uh, signed integers, and then IOX columns could be basically anything. So here's some of like the features in the read buffer that are like I guess pertinent to time series stuff and to influx DB type use cases. So the read buffer can do scans. Um, essentially like you give it predicates uh, pointed at table you say oh I want all the data that matches these predicates uh, it can do grouped aggregates so you can do effectively give me the sum of all of the temperatures grouped by like CPU or something um, it does windowed aggregates it's very similar to grouped aggregates but with obviously with a time component that's like the vast majority of graphs that that I see on like influx data dashboards are grouping things by time it's very common um, and it can also do like the schema exploration stuff. So if you're familiar with um, InfluxDB one um, or two, where you can do like show tag keys, show tag values, show measurements, and all of the possible constraints that you can put on those meta queries, it's gonna be able to support all of that as well. Um, it also does, like I've just described, try to describe with that very hierarchical data model. So it does pruning at all the different stages um, well, actually, the query engine does some of the very high-level pruning, um, but the re the rebuffer can basically do all of the table and row group pruning as well. So it can figure out whether to just ignore like swathes of data that it doesn't need to look at to answer a query. Um, we can do like predicate pushdown. So you give it all the predicates you need for your query. They all go down to the rebuffer. Um, it filters out all of the columns and parts of columns and rows and things it doesn't need based on the predicates. If it determines that for example, a column doesn't satisfy a predicate at all, then it can just short circuit the query and just return no results immediately, for example. Um, this is something that I think is kind of interesting because it's something that's been missing from InfluxDB for such a long time, um, is that we can do comparator operators um, if you give it a constant, so like region greater than west um, on tag columns because we can do predicates on any column in IOX um, and tags from InfluxDB line protocol just get converted into string columns. So that's kind of cool because you can only do filtering in InfluxDB, like filter on um, tag column equals something, not equals something, or regex something. But you'll be able to do like range-based comparative ones with IOPS. 
Um, and you can also aggregate any column as well. So you'll be able to do min, max of, of uh, tag columns, which is kind of interesting, um, other aggregates. All right, so we're just gonna talk a bit about how we actually get data like into the read buffer. So there's basically like a, a, a spectrum of types of compression that you can do, columnar compression. And this kind of applies not just to like IOPS's new columnar architecture, but this is also like relevant to InfluxDB because you can think of InfluxDB as, a, as like a sort of, uh, ha, has a columnar architecture on certain bits of the data model, particularly the timestamps and the field values. And it does compression on those, right? So at the one side, you've got no compression at all. So just don't compress anything. Um, that's great in terms of processing because you've always got the data that you want in front of you. Um, but it obviously means that everything gets stored in the largest possible format. The other end, you've got loads of compression, right? So you just use some general purpose um, algorithm to compress everything down and you get a really, really tiny footprint. But then you've got this huge, potentially huge processing cost because you have to decompress this data to do anything with it, right? And so you can just sort of think of this like spectrum along this line um, of various like ways of compressing things. So you've got very like um, heavy stuff down this end. Um, I would put like Gorilla, Simple 8B, these are algorithms that we use in InfluxDB to do block-based compression. I would put them down here as well. Um, you get a really amazing footprint from them as you saw in that early slide with the 500 odd million points um, in the under two gigs, but you, you have to decompress all of that to read anything. And then you can work your way down until you've got like a, a VEC of T, which is just like, you're not compressing it, you're just storing the raw, the raw values. And I'm gonna talk about the fact that the read buffer chooses to chooses some of this like middle ground, right? And we think we're making some interesting kind of choices there. Um, and the reason why we choose some of this middle ground is because the choice you make about how you compress your data, your column data, depends on the location of that, of like of that data, right? So the example here is that if your data is living in the cloud over a network and you can only really pull it down to the CPU at you know, a few hundred megabytes per second, but you can decompress it at you know, a gigabyte a second if it's you know, some fast like compression algorithm, then it's worth compressing it, right? Because like effectively you can decompress, the throughput here will be higher because you can decompress it faster than you can pull it over the network. So that's fine. And as you move, but as you move through this like medium, you get faster and faster throughput, right? So once you run to an SSD, now you can like pull things at gigabytes a second. Once you get onto main memory, you can pull things at tens of gigabytes a second. So, you know, do you compress things or not? Because if you can pull things at tens of gigabytes a second and you can only decompress something at a gigabyte a second, there's not much point in compressing it, right? Except the problem is that as you move through these storage mediums, the price does to, to have a, a, you know, have a gigabyte or whatever there increases, right? So the cloud's effectively free for all intents and purposes. SSDs are um, getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, but memory is still relatively expensive. I've said it's $10 a gigabyte, it probably isn't, but my point here is that it's significantly more expensive per gigabyte than it is um, in other uh, mediums. And of course, like it doesn't really scale in the same way, right? Because if you want to add like scale out memory, you end up having to scale up processor and all the other bits of hardware that need to you know be around that. So actually it turns out that it is, it is important to think about this compression question um, and to like get the most out of this really expensive medium. And so that's kind of what we've done here. And that's like what a lot of other column stores do as well. So I'm going to talk about the fact that we try to find um, encodings and compression schemes that we think will give us that bang for our buck, right? That they're going to give us really good compression. So we get more out of our memory, um, but we're still going to have really high performance and we're not going to pay a huge uh, processing cost to um, get the data out. So the first one of the first ones we look at is Dictionary encoding. So we do dictionary encoding on um, a lot of columns in, in IOX. It's really good for higher cardinality columns. The order of the um, data in the column isn't really a factor. It's great that you get constant time access um, to the data um, and you can operate directly on the data. So I'll just talk a little bit about this quickly, right? So if you've got all of these like values here that you're trying to compress, essentially all you do is you create a dictionary mapping. It's really important that these are ordered and then you end up with these encoded integer representations. And then effectively you store um, this dictionary here, and then you store this encoded column here. And obviously these are like four byte integers, for example. So 
you're going to reduce the size of your column if all of your strings are significant and large. If your strings are actually really, really small, you can still get a lot of performance benefits, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. So it's still kind of worth doing it. Um, we found, so here's an example of like how you would actually filter with this encoded column. So here's our di encoded dictionary column. We want to do a filter like where region equals east. So the first thing you've got to do, you basically look at the east in the dictionary, you turn it into an integer, and now you're basically just doing integer math and integer processing, which is significantly faster than string-based processing. Uh, and you can basically just apply that. I want all of the rows that contain x equals zero, and I get rows 0, 2, 7, 15 back, right? And then the nice thing about dictionary encoding, though, is that you can do um, other types of predicate. So you can do comparator ones. Now you can say, I want to do all of the rows where region is greater than north. And so effectively, all you have to do is convert um, again into the dictionary. And now you're just doing x is greater than one. And you can basically still answer this question. The reason that this works is because the ordinal relationship of the encoded IDs is the same as the ordinal relationship of the underlying data. The key takeaway here is that we're doing all of this processing. And we're finding these rows. And we're not actually like manipulating any strings. We're not reading strings. We're not comparing strings. We're doing all on integers. So this is what we mean when we talk about working on the compressed data directly. Um, another kind of uh, sort of piece you can do after this that we do on a lot of lower cardinality columns is something called run length encoding. So I've tried to keep the pictures similar here so you can just sort of see how it follows. Like effectively these first three bits are similar to dictionary encoding and there's just one more stage, right? And that extra stage is that instead of storing this entire um, encoded column, we, we compress it down. So if there are repeated values within the columns, like here, zeros and ones and zeros and threes, we just basically store those as what we call run lengths. So we'll store zero three times, one is three times, zero is three times, and so on and so forth. It's just an extra layer of compression. So for low cardinality columns, where you've got lots of these runs, you get incredible, incredible compression. Um, so it works really well if your column's sorted or if it's like secondary sorted or tertiary sorted. It can work really well there. It's not as consumable. Um, by consumable, I mean that you don't have effectively constant time access to the, to the compressed data because once you've got it in this final compressed format here with these tuples, you've got to undo those tuples to figure out where each row like logically sits, right? Like you know that it's somewhere maybe around here, but you've got to figure out exactly where it is. Um, so we kind of make a little change here. So we pre-compute the bit set. We pre-compute bit sets for each of these um, entries in the dictionary. So it's a bit of a cheat, right? So east will have a bit set that contains all of the rows that belong to east, north, south, and west will have their own. So that if we're doing like, if we're trying to do a query where we want to effectively look at all the values um, for region equals east, instead of having to decompress this um, representation, we can just look up a pre-computed bit set. So we store these pre-computed bit sets here and we want region equals east. Well, that's like ID zero. So we know that the rows we want here are just already stored in this bit set. We actually use um, roaring bitmaps for this, um, which we've used a lot in the past in InfluxDB. And they work really well because um, they also themselves do run length encoding. So it kind of works, works well in both ways. And again, you can do like regions greater than north. You can do the same thing. Um, you can either union these bit sets or you can just do the decompression step. So that's kind of how filtering works there. To give you some like idea of performance, um, if you're doing um, dictionary encoding on 10 million rows in a column, which has say a cardinality of 10,000, this is on a single thread, by the way. If you just draw, store a vector of strings, you're going to get maybe um, a throughput of about 200 megs a second or something, 200 uh, million values a second. But if you're using dictionary encoding, and we have got lots of like SIMD and stuff on top of this, then we're able to do about 4.2, 4.3 billion values per second. So each value is like a four byte integer. So this is about 17 gigabytes a second, um, which is near the limit of my memory bandwidth on my laptop. So it's pretty good, pretty good performance. So it seems like dictionary encoding is definitely all we need if it's this fast. Um, Except, like in some cases, our release just off the scale more performant, right? Because we've got a cheat, right? We've got pre computed bit sets for certain, um, for certain types of operation. And so, in this case, region equals east, we can basically answer this question in just a few hundred nanoseconds. And the footprint, memory footprint, is pretty similar to dictionary encoding. So, for a, card, a column where you've got like a relatively low cardinality, this is our release, definitely the one that we tend to prefer. 
But if you've got a high cardinality column, like something like tracing, like span ID, where it's essentially a unique value per row in the column, um, dictionary encoding and the, the original vector strings are going to perform exactly the same because they've still got to read through all of the rows in the column to find them, find them all. Um, but now RLE will give you a really fast answer to this question, but it's going to cost you a gigabyte in memory, right? Because if you've got no run lengths in your column, then you've essentially got as many run length encodings as you've got values. And so it's just overhead. So RLE is no good for higher cardinality columns. Um, if you're really concerned about space. So this is kind of interesting trade off between dictionary encoding and RLE encoding. And to be honest, we're still like working through empirically, like where we're going to move between the two encodings. So what about materialization? Materialization basically means, okay, so instead of finding some rows in your compressed column, like I know which rows I want, right? Maybe I've gone and checked another column and I want you just to return the values that are there. So um, in this case, we'll see, we see that when you've got constant time access to your underlying data, like the Beck of string or the dictionary, um, you basically, it's very, very fast. RLE is very, very fast when you've got a low cardinality because uh, it doesn't have much decompression to do. But as soon as you've got like really high cardinality in a re on this column, that's where RLE starts to struggle. So again, this is like the price you kind of pay for having this really fast filtering operations is that you pay it in materialization. So again, these are like things that we just, you have to sort of trade off. So to summarize, um, if you're working on the compressed data, you get a lot of benefits over the raw data. Uh, smaller, generally, lots of integer math, all the SIMD, vectorization, all that sort of stuff. So that means that even if the column is bigger, is a bigger footprint than the raw data, it can still be worth doing it just with the throughput. Um, RA is brilliant for filtering, but the size can grow. Um, and the dictionary filtering is proportional to the size, but the materialization is always brilliant because it's constant time access. Um, we also have numerical encodings as well. So, for example, you can do, um, you can provide I64 use for F64, and we'll just trim the high order bits. So, we'll store them in the lowest size um, physical representation we can. So, in this case here, we can take like a bunch of I64s and we can turn them into a bunch of U8s. And so, they only take six bytes instead of 48 bytes. Um, these are some of the things that we're like thinking about for numerical compression in the future. So we want to keep the compression stuff lightweight. So we can do things like frame of reference or where you take away like base values from the column and then everything is just scaled that way. Um, so we're still kind of thinking on how we're going to do this. Um, it's just really important that we keep this constant time access. So we're really trying to avoid like block based compression like we have in uh, in Um I'm just going to talk you through quickly like how we do some of the execution and the like late materialization. Um, so the first thing we try and do is just like try and prune away data, right? We don't, if we can avoid it, then that's what we'll do. But as soon as we have to like read some data out of the read buffer, this is kind of how we do it. Um, so here's like a query at the top, like a select query. So I want these costs, I want to price some predicates. So this, so the first thing we do is we apply all the predicates individually to each column. And these are all compressed in different ways that I just talked about. We do all of that like filtering on the compressed values. And then we produce these bit sets of, of like rows that match the value of match the predicates. And then we basically do a ton of like integer uh, set operations on these bit sets to provide the final set of rows that we know we need. And the only then once we know exactly which rows we need, do we actually materialize the original values, right? So we get things like, you know, host equals A1, host equals A2, instead of like working on these integers. So this allows us to basically reduce the kind of, um, like increase the performance and reduce the amount of memory and reduce like any of the wasted resources by messing with strings until the very last minute. We also can do this with grouping as well. So um, we can basically, it's a similar process. You apply your predicates to each of the individual columns, you get your bit set. And then the interesting thing here, I think, is that you actually build your group keys. So when you're doing grouping, you effectively have to build your group keys and then you can associate all your aggregates for each of those group keys. And we do that all using the encoded compressed data. So we don't even use any of the string, original string values for group keys until we've actually built all of the aggregates and we've got the final answer. And then at the end, we materialize the individual values that belong to each of those group keys. So that works really well for us as well. Um, just looking at time, we've got about 10 minutes left. So I'm just gonna go through some numbers really quickly. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna like preface this with, so these numbers are gonna compare influx DB and IOX. Um, 
and the influx db numbers were done on a very big machine with like 24 cores and tons of uh, memory um, an MVMV drive and the iox numbers were done on a, a laptop with like a single thread so the use case um, is like a synthetic kind of high cardinality tracing one so the idea is that um, effectively um, we're going to have columns here that have got very high cardinality like span id so effectively unlimited cardinality we've got other things like trace id and lower cardinality columns and we compress them in different ways and then we're going to compare how we can perform these sort of certain queries on influx db versus iox so the first thing is like space so iox is up to 10 times smaller footprint in terms of the read buffer size than it is on influx db so for 60 million rows of this kind of tracing data influx needed 36 gigs to store it on disk and iox uh, read buffer was storing it just under four gigs in memory um, so that's quite a big significant difference okay so what about like a needle in a haystack problem where an index is really good and useful so this is something that influx db is just going to be very good at if we can get close to the influx db performance then we're going to be happy like in iox so you can see that influx db obviously does really well because it's got an index to fall back on it. it can just find this trace id from the secondary index whereas the read buffer has to actually go and hunt for it and and like go through columnar data to find it it's still keeping up we're able to do uh, <clears throat> an under like 20 milliseconds basically to to find a single trace id across these like 60 million rows so we're kind of really happy with that this is like the worst scenario for the read buffer as well for the column database the better scenario is when we want to do like big aggregations over high cardinality so um this is like give me the give me like the total trace time for all my traces and group by trace id so if you try and do this in influx for 1 million rows, you can do it in about 30 seconds in influx, but it will take 10 gigabytes of peak memory. The read buffer will do it in like 45 milliseconds and it won't use much memory at all. Influx DB was able to answer this on a 10 million row data set, but it took 18 minutes and it used all of my memory, 128 gigs and a lot of swap space. Um, whereas the read buffer can do it in under a second and it uses about 150 megabytes, but that's not even peak, That's it's kind of, I won't get into it, but that's just the total memory usage. So it doesn't even peak at 150 megabytes. And then for the 60 million row case, Influx just can't answer this query. It's just not, it's just not what it's designed to do well, whereas IOX is able to do it in, in a few seconds. So we're really happy with this kind of like performance here because these are the kind of use cases that we're really targeting IOX have been good at. Um, and we'll take the kind of trade-off of the previous one where it's it's keeping up basically, but it's just not, you know, it's fine. It's fast enough is the way we're looking at it. Um, you can also do like schema exploration with the read buffer as well. So like, what about if you want to do the equivalent of like show tag keys, how does that look in a columnar architecture without an index? Well, it looks pretty good. So Inf Influx is obviously very good at these kind of queries because it's got an index and it's designed to like, to answer these kind of schema exploration queries, but the read buffer can do them in, you know, several hundred like microseconds and that's because we just ask the question in a slightly different way we can take advantage of a lot of the vectorization a lot of the compressed data we work directly on it so we're just asking a bunch of questions of integers rather than a bunch of questions of strings effectively um, some of the future work that we're looking at doing in the rebuffer so i won't spend too much time on this but we're going to add more data types we're going to add more operators so you can do like regex and like and things like that we're going to add more encodings um, we've got a proposal for delete support, so you will be able to delete things out of the read buffer. It's immutable, so we'll be solving that problem with things like tombstones. Um, and there's still just more implementation to do and to, to round out. And then also we're going to add things like predicate caching and buffer pooling. Like these numbers for IOX are just sort of the beginning. Um, they're just going to get a, a lot faster, we think. Um, and then some more some more stories around like how we're going to do concurrent execution. That's about it. I think I've just gone over on time. Thanks, Ed. Uh, looks like there's a couple of questions here. Um, I, I know Paul already answered this, but just in case anyone else had this question, does this new columnar database draw any familiarity with Cassandra DB? Well, it's a, it's I mean it's a column-oriented database, so there's that kind of similarity. But um, maybe Paul could answer more on like how he thinks operationally it's going to compare. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm basically I say it's a completely different design. Um, the design of IOX is more similar to things like Vertica or ClickHouse, 
but also with the caveat that IOX is designed to be operationally like working on data that's in memory and in object storage. Like ideally your working set fits in memory. Um, so it's, it's gonna be very, very different than Cassandra. It'd be hard to draw parallels between the operational characteristics of Cassandra and the operational characteristics of IOX. Is it possible to have a configurable selection between RLE and dictionary, or is there an architectural limitation requiring a decision between the two? So I think that the short answer to that is that we probably will at some point expose the ability to, to choose ahead of time as an operator how you want to like store certain columns. But ideally, we would like the IOX and the rebuffer to kind of have very good heuristics in there so that for the vast majority of cases, it's just going to do the right thing. The nice thing about the rebuffer as well is that it's immutable. So we only have to make that decision and stick to it. We don't have to worry about that data changing and then having to reconsider the, the encoding. Yeah, we know a bunch of the statistics up front of each of the pieces that are stored in the rebuffer. And so you can make, I think, there's a good input to drive those heuristics that it's talking about. I think the one of the interesting things also is that because data moves from you know this hot state in the mutable buffer to like essentially a snapshot state in read buffer or you know in parquet files, it's totally possible that from partition to partition, the underlying encoding for the exact same column could be totally different, and that's based on the actual shape of the data. It's, it's based on the cardinality of the data. And if you want to get really crazy, like we could do things later on, like change things based off query patterns and stuff like that. But that's like years down the road. <laughs> All right, a couple more questions. When will InfluxDB IOX be ready for production? So our, <laughs> that's great. Oh, always that question. Yeah. Uh, so our timeline <laughs> basically is we have this uh, deployed. It, so we have our own environment in cloud called tools, which is what we use to monitor our own cloud environment. So basically we use our product to monitor our product. Um, and we have uh, it deployed there right now, taking a little bit of data. Over the next couple of months, we're going to scale that up so that we're using it ourselves in a production capacity uh, at a fairly large scale. Um, our, our tools cluster gets somewhere on the value on the order of like 1. Is it 1.2 or 2.4? Uh, do you remember? up 2.4, like 2.4 values a second of data written in and obviously a bunch of query workloads for monitoring and million values and stuff like that. Right, it's more than two million values, not 2.4 values. Yeah, 2.4 million values, sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, the next step for us will be to release IOX as essentially an alpha or beta product that people can opt into for our cloud environment where we can control it and we can continue to deploy it. And we can also have other backend systems that essentially like pull the data out aggressively into object storage to make sure that we don't lose data, for example, stuff like that. Um, so our goal is to have uh, something available for uh, alpha usage by you know, late Q2, early Q3. Um, and then you know, we'll go from there as far as when you know the builds that we're going to be producing like the publicly available builds that you can use in your own environment will be available for prod um we're not going to have a 1.0 release of iox anytime this year i don't think uh so if you're waiting for 1.0 is your is your delineation for whether or not it's ready for prod like that's not going to happen we will have production like ready generally available supported instances of iox available in our own cloud this year but again that's because we can control the operating environment and we can add guardrails and safety around it um so it kind of depends on you uh i mean it, as we get far like i said our, our goal is first build by the end of march those are obviously just for testing and playing around with and then as we get farther along we can see how things go and people can ideally kind of uh, pay attention and you know determine what's what's the best decision for them. All right. Will InfluxDB IOX replace or complement InfluxDB? So it will be a complement to InfluxDB uh, because InfluxDB two has a lot of things in the API that are completely outside the the scope of write data, query data. 
So the plan is to have IOX as essentially a storage backend for InfluxDB. So you could use IOX individually on its own, or you can use, you can have InfluxDB, you know, 2.x if you're using that. We will have um, a code that will allow you to basically convert all of that TSM data in InfluxDB over to IOX and then start using IOX as essentially a storage and query backend for InfluxDB. Okay. What kind of object store will be supported? So uh, S3, Azure, GCP, um, the local file system, just memory, if you want to run entirely in memory. And then uh, obviously any, any object store that supports any one of those APIs will be supported, but we'll also want to add like Ceph and Minio and stuff like that. Awesome. Uh, thank you. We'll just give everyone here another minute or two if anyone has any last minute questions. Thank you all for attending today's InfluxDB IOX Tech Talks session. Uh, so we have these sessions every month. So they're held every on the second Wednesday of every month. So the next session will be on March 10th at 8 a.m. Pacific. So same time just next month. Um, so we look forward to seeing everyone there. And of course, the team is always super excited to present uh, a project update. So it doesn't look like there are any more questions. So once again, thank you everyone. This session will be available on YouTube later today as well as as impulse slides. Thank you.